if u zero is equal to u, u, it's still gonna be u exactly. This is because we just wrote the equation without the superscripts, right? Without the superscript, the equation is exactly satisfied by the solution to the linear equations. So if u0 is already u, then the left-hand side is u1, and u1 has to be also u in order for this equation to be satisfied. Well, unless d is degenerate, unless d has zero entries, it's a diagonal matrix, right? So if all the diagonal parts are non-zero, then u1 can only be u. And therefore, if u1 is equal to u, u2 also has to be u. If u2 has to be u, u3 also has to be u, etc. So if you start it with the right solution, you always end up with the right solution. Of course, that's a big assumption, right? So you almost never start with the right solution. So what do you get? What do you get if you don't have the right solution to start with? So let's define, let's look at now the error equation. So the error equation is looking at, so if I define solution error ek to be the difference between the solution I have minus the real solution. Oh, it's the, in practice, I never know what UK, uh, EK is because I don't know the true solution. But if I can derive a governing equation for the evolution of EK, we can analyze, is the, is the solution error becoming smaller and smaller or becoming larger and larger as I iterate? And we want to construct the method or derive conditions for the method so that EK is going to keep decreasing as I increase k. So how do we derive the equation for ek? We subtract this equation with the, super, with the superscript. Uh, we subtract the equation without a superscript from the equation with the superscript. By doing this, the left-hand side would be duk plus 1 minus du. The right hand side would be B minus L U K minus U U K minus B minus L U minus U U. Right? This is just subtracting two equalities. Both are true. And simply by linearity and the definition of EK, the left hand side becomes D of EK plus 1. And the right hand side, the B fortunately cancels. What we are left with is L plus U, and I think we have a minus sign here, times EK. So the last thing we want to do is further simplify this by multiplying a D inverse. Remember, remember uh, the method only works if D has non-zero diagonals. So let's multiply a D inverse on both equations, uh, both sides of the equation. So the left hand side becomes EK plus one, the right hand side becomes minus D inverse times L plus U times EK. Good here. So we can start analyzing whether the EK would increase or decrease over time. What determines if ek is going to increase or decrease over time. Eigenvalue. Yes, the eigenvalue of this matrix. This matrix is so important, it has a name. It's called the iteration matrix. So this matrix determines, actually the stability of this matrix determines if the ek is going to increase over time or decrease over time. Okay, so because if this matrix, if the iteration matrix, well, the iteration matrix of Jacobi iteration or Jacobi iteration matrix can be expressed as uh, eigenvalue decomposition V times lambda times V inverse. Okay, then if we can say E0, our initial error, which of course we don't know, can be expressed as a, a summation of AI times VI, where VI is the columns of the matrix V. 
Okay, the same expression can be written as the matrix V times a vector A, so A1, etc. to AN. Right? So this is an so if the iteration matrix is um, has a has a full set of eigenvalues, we can basically write it like that, right? Write any vector to be V times a vector corresponding to the linear combination of the eigenvectors that gives you that vector. Yes? Why isn't that uh, the lambda? Shouldn't that be the lambda matrix? Are we, aren't we like decoupling? Uh, why is it lambda here? No. Here? Which equation are you looking at? Sorry, yeah, right there. Okay. Yeah, this is this is we are just uh, trying to express the initial error in our initial guess as a linear combination of the columns in V. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I see. Right. So, so if we can do that, then E one is going to be V times lambda times V inverse times E zero, which by this expression is v times lambda times v inverse times v times this vector a, right? Okay, and this v inverse and v cancels. So we get v times lambda times the vector a. We can keep going. Now, instead of v times a, being E0, E1 is V times lambda times A. We can do the same trick again. E2 would be equal to going through the same thing. We would have V lambda V inverse times V lambda A. And again, this cancels. We get a V times lambda square times A. And we can keep going, right? E to the kth index would be V times lambda to the kth power times a. So as long as the diagonal entries of lambdas are all less than one, right? Or, or if it's complex, its uh, magnitude is, has to be less than one. And then this ek would ultimately diminish to zero. We would be happy that we have a convergent iterative method, which means E k is going to get, go to zero, and what does E k goes to zero mean? My U k is going to converge to U. So although I don't know what U is, I know when k is sufficiently large, I have a sufficiently accurate approximation to U. All right, and also here we are lucky that we can check how well we are converging because we also have the residual that is we can check convergence by looking at the residual k equal to b minus a u k so this should be zero if u k is already u right so this is a good criterion for convergence. And by the way, the convergence here is different from the convergence of a numerical method of a finite difference discretization or a finite element discretization. When we talk about convergence in finite difference, we are thinking, oh, okay, so let's decrease our grid size by a factor of two. Should my numerical solution approach the analytical solution? Right, so that is the kind of convergence we are talking about in finite difference or finite element or finite volume. But here, convergence has a different meaning. Although we all use the word convergence, it actually means different things. Convergence here means the convergence of the kth iteration to the discrete solution of a PD, right? So, so the because a u equal to b is already a discretized differential equation. So even if I get the exact u here, the u would be a discrete solution. 
And this UK is an approximation to the discrete solution. We are talking about how does UK converge to the discrete solution here. Well, that means when you solve the equation using iterative methods, you are making two approximations here. One approximation is, of, of course, the discretization of the PDE. The numerical solution only approximates the analytical solution up to an approximation error. And the second is that, you are, uh, that, that of course, both involves spatial discretization and time discretization if you have time. So, so remember, you have the spatial terms, also you have time de derivative discretization terms. And now, if you have space and time discretization, you count that as two sources of errors. Now, this is a third source of error. That is, when k is not sufficiently large, you not even have an exact solution to the discrete equations. Right? You can estimate how much error you have by looking at the residual. But then, remember, that's a, a, another source of approximation, another source of error here.